Thank you. I, I am really happy. I mean, it's 5.30, and I'm seeing this crowd out there. I was expecting about five people to show up. So this is awesome. This is awesome. By the way, how many of you are, have ordered food on DoorDash before? All right, cool, awesome, <laughs> majority of you. All right, thank you for being here. Uh, welcome to this session, ML Ops at DoorDash. My name is Heen Liu, and I lead the ML platform team at DoorDash. Um, so yeah, first of all, I really want to say thank you for being here. Uh, you have choices, right? You choose to be here. You could be out there drinking beer with your coworker or friends, but you, you decided to be here, so I appreciate that. The agenda of my talk will be including the motivation of this talk, which is to share a strategy of adopting MLOps, and talk a little bit about the MLOps blueprint and go into the strategy that I'm advocating for, and I also show our journey of adopting MLOps in the last two years and do a summary. So at this point, most companies are applying machine learning and adopting MLOps, um, right? And you'll hear probably this high probability that your company falls into this bucket. And for personally for me, you know, to able to successfully adopt MLOps, I believe you need to have a strategy. And in this session, I would like to share a strategy from my perspective and then use DoorDash as a case study for that. But before we go into the strategy, let's talk about a little bit of the, the blueprint and talk at a high level what MLOps is. I'm sure most of you are familiar with. So most companies, you know, by now recognize MLOps is extremely important and needed, right? Uh, so at a high level, what's been considered as MLOps is a, an engineering discipline, which is an intersection between machine learning, DevOps, data engineering. And the whole point is just trying to bring automation and infrastructure to speed up the ML development process and bring models to production. However, for this discipline to be productive, I believe we will also have to consider the other three elements, which around people, the people that are building MLOps, the people who are adopting, the processes involved to make that smooth, as well as some of the best practices that you need to consider. For me, it's kind of interesting. Most companies are on a similar journey of adopting MLOps. We all have similar needs. But the question is, is there a strategy, is a good strategy you want to follow? What is the best starting point to get started at? Right? And for me, it comes down, what I think about is going to be based on the specific ML needs of that company. And that you're going to hear that line again and again. So while I was doing research on this topic, I encountered this AI Infrastructure Alliance, which aims to help the AI industry to converge on a common understanding of the core components of an ML, ML application. And it consists of the ML workflow and the canonical, canonical stack. Right? And this diagram depicts the, the typical ML workflow, including for data stage, the training stage, and such. The question is, so it's all, all of these ML workflows are fairly clear, right? We don't have to figure it out. We don't have to spend a whole lot of time like, figuring these things out. What's more important is figure out is how best to make it a reality at your company or other companies that you work at. And what's the best way to do that? And this diagram depicts the, the canonical stack. So you see these components on there, I'm sure you're fairly familiar with, familiar with, data engineering, training, deployment, and such. Again, similar story. The components are fairly, fairly well-defined. But the, the big question to ask if you're going to adopt our office, where do you start? Which pieces are more important than others? What's the right sequence to build them out? in terms of build or buy or adopt, whatever that might be. So then again, it's gonna come down to the specific ML needs of a company. And it's a fun topic to talk about. You may have seen like different maturity, maturity level, 
you know, ops maturity level that's being advocated by Microsoft and Google. The way I think about this is it's good to have goals in terms of what you want to achieve in adopting ML ops, and also to know the progress. So how do you decide which material level your company should be on? Right? So it's a, the way I think about it is it's a good yardstick to, to, to keep in mind, but don't let this keep you waking up at night. Another way to think about material level is from these dimensions that's on the left-hand side. Organizational, organizational alignment, data, training, and so on. And you have different levels for each of those dimensions. So should, should the maturity level be high for all these dimensions? In an ideal world, probably yes. But as you know, we all have limited resources, constraints, and time, right? So how do you go about deciding the right material level for each of these dimensions? And what factor would you use to decide that? And that's going to be the topic for the next slide. So the strategy that I'm advocating, I'm having kind of fun with this, it's in the form of an objective function. And this objective function has four inputs. The use case, the culture, the people, technology. And why are these important? They are important because they have a huge influence on the outcome of the adoption. And we can use this information to prioritize on what we want to do first, second, and third. And what, do you want, what do we want to spend time and effort in as part of adopting MLOps? So we're going to go through each one of these. Let's start with the use case. It's essentially identifying the game that you're playing. Right? If you work at a company, it should be fairly easy for you to identify the use cases at your company. And why is that useful? It's useful because you can use that information to decide which components of the stack or the workflow is a must have versus nice to have, as well as the right maturity level for each of those dimensions that we talked about. So for example, if your use case is in the banking or insurance and healthcare, so maybe if that, in that case, you want to double down on the governance part of your stack, right? Because fairness, biases, and such are extremely important, as well as ML explainability. And maybe velocity is just not as important as those aspects that I just talked about. Culture. This is a big deal. It's going to heavily influence the MLOps adoption pace at your company. Because it's based on how willing your company is at taking risks in making decisions, technology adoptions. So you want to understand that and spend a, round of my, spend a good amount of effort in, in doing that. Velocity, how fast or slow moving that company is. Because you want to operate at the pace that your customers operate at. And that drives the expectation on how fast the MLOps adoption needs to be. So you want to demonstrate the impact and result. Decision-making process, is consensus? Is there a process for doing that? Who are the stakeholders? Who are the key decision makers? You want to align with those folks and spend the right time and effort doing so. As well as collaborative, right? How much time you need to spend on collaborating with other teams that by introducing ML ops in, into your company. And our ops stack has huge dependency on other pieces of infrastructure in the company. So you want to assess and understand the maturity of each of these infrastructure that's listed out here. So data infrastructure and ML is kind of tied to the hip, right? Because ML needs data. So if the maturity of your data infrastructure is not there, you definitely want to spend time and effort advocating for what's needed for your customer to move fast. Same with experimentation. I'm sure you know that ML is a highly iterative process. How easy is it for your data scientists to do experiments? If it's not, then you've got to go and spend time and advocate for that. And similar with CICD and compute infrastructure. 
people. This is about your customers, stakeholders, decision makers. You, you want to know who they are. You want to align with their needs. You want to make sure they understand your strategy. You, know, you want to make sure they understand, make sure you have constant communication with them. Right? And more importantly, align their needs and the MLOps infrastructure impact. I want to share a real story here. So uh, I interview a candidate, and I ask him, what's your motivation for you to make a change? And his answer is, at his company, they value, they don't value the ML infrastructure team as much as the data scientist team. That was his primary reason for looking for change. So there is some organiz organizational alignment issue there. Right, so it's important to make sure to do that. So with that strategy, with that objective function and four inputs that I just shared, let's use ML, let's use DoorDash as a case study. For us, in terms of use cases, as a logistics and e-commerce company, we have these use cases in you know, optimization, search recommendation, and such. So for us, velocity is more important than governance. It's by knowing that that we want to make the right decisions in terms of how to move fast. Our culture is pretty much impact-driven, fast-moving, favor iteration and such. So I want to make sure that I align or team up with data scientist team and product engineering team to collaborate and drive impact together. As well as technologies, we are what well, I consider we're in the early adult phase, right? We have some, we have data warehouse, we have data lake. Uh, there's some something that's coming, something being planned. So understand the gap and plan the ML infrastructure around that. And then the people, the data scientist community. I want to align with them in driving the direction and strategy of the ML ops such that everybody on the same page, so we wouldn't have that issues that I just shared with you earlier. So we, we use all these inputs, specific use cases, culture, technology, and people. So how do we decide, what, what's our journey of building out our MOOps stack, essentially? So our, it's kind of interesting when I look back at this. We started out actually built the prediction service first. And why did we do that? We did that because we want to align with a customer, the team called logistics team. At that point in time, they need such a service, right? Prediction service with low latency and scalable because the previous version was not able to keep up with the DoorDash growth. So understanding the needs of our customers, align with them, we know that will make an impact to the company. So therefore, we prioritize this first and actually partner with them and build this out as the first piece of our stack. And then as more data scientists join the company and we have more models on our, our infrastructure, then the needs for a single source of truth reproducibility, co-versioning, all that stuff became important. Then we invested in building a centralized model training service. And then as we have more profile, high profile use cases on our platform, and we want to protect the downside when something goes wrong with models and such, then we started investing in building out our feature and model prediction quality infrastructure. And then as our infrastructure improves and we, our data lake is in a decent shape, they invested in, in building a feature engineering framework, a declarative feature engineering framework to help data scientists to create features at scale and efficiently. Right, so looking back, it's as if like we, you know, our, our, the way we proceed, the sequence that we build is in the reverse order of a typical ML development process. 
If someone asked me like two years ago, what's the sequence that I want to build this out? I wouldn't have predicted we'd gone down this path. But we've gone, this, we've gone down this path because of all those things that I talked about. Right? The strategy, the inputs into the strategy, and use that to decide, figure out what's more important, how to prioritize, how to align with stakeholders and customers and so on. So I just want to share a, a, a very condensed version of our stack here, of our MLOP stacks. We have Snowflake as a, our data warehouse. We have a data lake, and we use Spark a lot on Databricks for feature engineering as well as model trainings. Uh, and that's also MLflow for uh, tracking experiments. And then we use Redis as our feature store. And then we have a homegrown SQL prediction service. So it's a mixed bag of commercial products, open source, as well as homegrown, homegrown solutions. And one of the key things that help us to move fast is to focus on just a few live machine learning libraries for our data centers. So those are PyTorch and LightGBM. Surprisingly, that's able to uh, meet a lot of the use cases that I share. Okay, so in summary, successful ML ops, you need a strategy. You need to know those inputs and use those to prioritize. Use those to decide what's more important. It is a team sport. Adopting our apps. Organizational, depending on the culture of your company, organizational alignment could be simple or could be very, very challenging. But it's an extremely important part to be successful at this. And then finally, start small and iterate. It's a well known practice, but if you do this consistently, you will achieve meaningful results. So that's all I have. Uh, thank you for the presentation. So uh, you talked about the journey of DoDash and MLOps in the past. What are what does the future look like in DoDash, uh, specifically within MLOps? Like, what are the main things you you're working on uh, improving in the future? Your question is about the future. Yeah. So you talked about the past, like the journey of MLOps at DoDash until now. What are you looking at? What challenges are you trying to solve given um, where you are right now? Yeah. And what yeah, will the that, future that, look that's like? That's a good question. Um, so the future of us is, is fairly bright. The adoption has been great. Uh, but there are new use cases coming up that the platform that we need to evolve and expand to support. Namely around, you know, I share about PyTorch and LightGBM. There's more use cases around uh, natural language processing, computer visions. So we need to evolve our platform to support those use cases. And the other one is around um, the feature volumes. We've got more and more use cases where the volume is very large. So we start with Redis, and it's working out well. But for these large volume of features, we need to figure out how to do that efficiently and, and also to maintain the cost at the same time. So it's a very interesting technical challenge for the engineering team to, to do that moving forward. And obviously, the other part is we talk about the feature and model uh, monitoring. There's a lot more we can do there. I believe we can build out like ways for data scientists to debug issues quickly and easily, right? Slicing and dicing the prediction results and stuff like that. So yeah, there's a lot that's left to be done. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. I really liked it right here. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, so I work for a very large corporation, Raytheon Technologies, and what I find is that our company culture is very slow moving, you know, to grow. We've been around for a very long time and it kind of makes sense why that's the case. And I really like your focus on kind of meeting the business where it's at, focusing on the current priorities and then getting wins that way. So my question is, is how did you see the culture change and willingness to adopt new new solutions by, by doing that approach. You mentioned your company's culture is a slow moving. Yeah, very, I, very slow moving. Okay. 
It's kind of good because you don't have to iterate too fast. No, but <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think it comes down like my view is if you can demonstrate the impact, right? You know, partnering with your business folks or the PM or whatever it is, and then demonstrate the impact. I'm sure your company is applying machine learning, right? So partner with those and enable them. Right? You don't have to build all the pieces, but just the necessary parts to get that going, to get the flywheel going. And once the flywheel has demonstrated some impact, then I, I think that will, the pace will, will increase and become easier and easier as you able to gain the trust from your partner. It's not an easy problem, <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> Yeah, I have the next question, thank you. Um, actually, a little bit follow up the, to the last question. Uh, to your experience, how those different functional teams, like data engineering teams, data scientists, MLOps, um, organizational-wise, is it better to put them in one central org? Or <laughs> if it's in, by historical reasons, they are scattered everywhere. How, how we work around that, or how we work with that? This is a $10,000 question. <laughs> so it's kind of funny. I was talking to one of the executives this morning, uh, and, and she is managing the entire team from end to end, like data scientists, data engineering, and MLOps infrastructure. She said she wouldn't have it out in other ways because she believed they need, she needs the end-to-end -end control for her to be successful. That's what she said, okay? I, I'm not sure that's a right or wrong answer here, but I think it depends on a lot of the people that are, are running the show and the culture as well. So, I mean, at DoorDask, we are pretty much distributed, right? Data engineering is, is a separate organization. Data scientists is a separate organization. And data platform, which is our ML platform, is part of. So, it could work either way, but I, I don't think that is a right or wrong answer. It always comes down to the culture, the people that's driving it. So I have a question that I think is related, uh, maybe a little bit more zoomed in on how do you define the delineation of responsibilities between data scientists and ML engineers? Uh, for example, who owns the models? and how do you ensure that it's production quality code in those models? All right, good question. What's your definition of an ML, ML engineer? I'll put that right back on you. <laughs> I'll, I'll turn that right back around to you, right? I, maybe DoorDash has a case study, for example. The reason I ask this question is, you know, as an industry, we haven't really standardized on the responsibility of, of these titles, right? So when, when I interview a candidate, they said they are an ML engineer, I asked them, what does that mean? Because at, at, at least for me at DoorDash, the, the three roles that relate to machine learning are very, very distinct and, and the responsibility are very, very clear. So data scientists, machine learning engineers, and we call ML infra engineer, right? At DoorDash anyway, the data scientist owns the model. They build a model, they own the model, they take the model to production, very, very clear. ML engineers help integrate a model into their infrastructure or their service, whatever that might be. It could be search infrastructure or recommendation, whatever that might be. And they work with data scientists, data scientists to make sure the model works well, the pipeline's running on a, you know, on a regular basis and things like that. And our ML infra team, we don't own the model. What we do own is infrastructure to enable data scientists to do everything that they need to do to apply machine learning at DoorDash. I, I do recognize that at, at some startups, right, where the role or responsibility is kind of blurry, right? A data scientist could be doing all these three things that I mentioned. So it's always interesting when I ask people, like, what does that mean? What does a data scientist do at your company? But it's good to have a very clear separations of who owns what at the end of the day. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I felt that you, you went through a very nice framework uh, from, the, from a top-down perspective. Like, you know you have time to plan for how to improve 
MLOps in a, in a company, but um, there, there are many cases in which the, the, the teams are very distributed, uh, responsibilities are distributed, and it's really always a um, prioritization uh, question whether you should spend more time in, uh, improving MLOps versus doing any other operational stuff. So from, from a perspective of a more IC uh, side from uh, on, on companies on where this is possible, right? To, for the IC to um, influence the decisions on prioritization. Uh, do you have any tips or ideas on how to better do this? Like how to better influence the team to uh, work on MLOps improvements uh, versus other operational or less longer term uh, projects? Wow. I, I I love this question. They are. <laughs> but a good question, so. Um, I'm going to try my best. I don't know if I have the best, an uh, the best answer you're looking for. Uh, if I were in that shoe, what do I do? It, I think it's all, for me, it's all about aligning to, to the company's goals, whatever that might be, right? If we want to maybe build out a new product, or enable ML use cases for a certain product that we want to improve, business metric, whatever that might be. So figure that out first. If you figure that out, you can get teams to align behind that. Then I think the rest will be a lot easier. Because if ML off infrastructure is the roadblock to get there, then you're going to get, a, you're going to get people to help you out if that is a roadblock. But the key thing is you have to align on what the goal is that matters to the company, that matters to the business, that matters to the lead leadership team. That would be my suggestion to start out with. Um, yeah, I feel like we're all asking kind of similar questions, but we couldn't help but laugh. I'm sitting here with uh, two ML engineers or ML ops engineers with my company. I'm a data scientist. And as a data scientist, we tend to have clear, a clear view of who our stakeholders are. They're you know, very well defined in the projects that we work in. Unfortunately, MLOps doesn't have that kind of clear definition about what a stakeholder is. Sometimes we can feel like we're the stakeholders for them as data scientists. So, and, and it leads to kind of a um, thankless job that they have where they don't really get appreciation when they succeed. Um, and yeah, that's why we were laughing. You know, I, we, we try to fix it at a personal level, but at an or organizational level, how do you define success in ML ops? How do you define your stakeholders? How do you interact with your stakeholders to build successful projects? Wow, that is hard, hard question. <laughs> how do you find success? How do you find success? <laughs> um, have you had a chat with your manager? <laughs> if I were you, that would be the first thing that I would do. We have a chat with the leadership team, the manager, to, to align on that, right? Um, so yeah, I think it's great. Maybe we can kind of condense that into how do you define success as an ML ops engineer, as an ML ops infrastructure team, I guess, right? What's a KPI? <laughs> Did you have like a vision document in your team? Does you have that? All right. But anyway, I think whatever, if you have an MLOps infrastructure team, obviously the first thing you want to do is define what your North Star metrics are, whatever that might be, right? And then you use that to drive your, your development, your priorities. But coming back to the impact though, um, it's a great question. And so, so your customer, who are your customers? Your data scientist team, I imagine, right? And they work with product engineering team to improve some kind of business metrics. So hopefully you, you're kind of one step away from that impact, right? But you want to be staying as close to that as possible in terms of calling out, you know, at the end of the quarter, what that might be, calling out how does your project contribute to that, those business metrics? That's what you want to do. That's what you want to highlight. There's some direct impact there. There's some indirect impact there. 
But without your project, without your infrastructure, the data scientists wouldn't be able to do what they did. So you want to highlight that. That would be my advice and suggestion. Hi. Um, so I have a bit of a hypothetical question. Uh, so let's assume there are 10 teams, each with a data scientist and, then, and a set of engineers building models and productionizing them and delivering um, efficiently or inefficiently. Is there a case to be made to centralize or standardize the model development and deployment practices? If yes, how would you make such a proposal and get it approved? Because it may seem like a step back or slowing things down. Uh, or would you say, let individual teams do their own thing? If I hear the question correctly, is there a way to centralize and standardize the model deployment process? Is there a need if individual teams... Oh, is there a need to do that? Yeah, if, if a team is composed of data scientists and engineers and infrastructure and, and is working fine and there are 10 or 20 of those at a company. I think at a high level, right, at the end of the day is you want to enable data scientists to be efficient and effective at what they need to do. I think that's it. at the high, high, your, high, your highest level goal that you want to accomplish. Whether that is you know, centralized or standardized, I think, I, th I think it comes down to, again, depending on a culture, how people are familiar with and the processes that a company provides. But if you enable your data scientists to move fast and do what they need to do, then you might end up doing that, the kind of things you talk about, right? Providing maybe a standardized way that's easy so people, so data scientists know how to do that if they were to switch team, for example. So I don't know if I answered your question. We can talk a little bit afterward too. We have time for one more question. Uh, so my company's machine learning platform team is kind of like in the early stage. So I do have two questions that sort of related, but also um, a little bit more technical maybe. Um, so I'm curious, in the DoorDash cases, do you, does your team ever run into a case that, um, because machine learning platform essentially is still kind of like an infrastructure, infrastructure level of uh, uh, products or, or, or services, right? So the cost to do some early explorations in terms of technical choices is still higher than some production teams or uh, application teams. So do you ever run into cases that your team needs to spend time on doing some early prototyping on some infrastructure projects, specific ties to machine learning platform? Uh, there it needs to be a trade-off decision whether how much time they're gonna spend on this prototype versus do they need to end early and try something else or how you make a decision on whether they're gonna keep going on that prototype. Another question related to this is, um, so does DoorDash machine learning platform team ever run into a case that you made a technical decision to choose certain tech stacks in your platform, but after maybe six months or a year, because the use cases change or some other changes, they end up to be a maybe a wrong decision or improper decision retrospectively. How, do your, how does your team deal with that if you have run into that cases? The, the answer to the session, second question is no. Okay. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the first, uh, the, the first question is, uh, does, does team at DoorDash or ML infrastructure team invest in, in like doing POCs on some infrastructures? Is that what I heard? Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, good question. I mean, this whole space is evolving, right? Constantly changing and updating. So we, we constantly have to keep an eye out and figure out what's important and, and what are the gaps that we have, right? Something might be working okay today, but we knowing that the use cases that's coming down the pipeline, the number of models, the feature volumes that, that are getting huge. We need to figure out how to do that efficiently the next six months or a year. So we have to constantly invest time in doing that. And the way we do that is by aligning with use cases, because that is a great forcing function, right? We're not just doing POC for the POC sick, but using a customer use case to drive the requirements of the technology 
or whatever it is that we doing POC on to satisfy that specific use case. And, and if you do that, you know, the team member will be more excited because they know that if they build something, it will be adopted, right? If we can satisfy the needs of the use case. If you can align those two, I think that will be a good, a, a good marriage between spending time on something new and able to bring something that's impactful to, to our customers. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, we're at the end of the session. I know it's at the end of the day. So thank you so much, Jan, for walking us through that. And, thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming out.